Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming to the presentation today. Um, and as mentioned, uh, I wanted to, the, the talk that I want to give today is about uh, an open source framework for generating embedding vectors. And exactly, you know, there are some folks in the audience who are a little bit unfamiliar about what an embedding is or how those work exactly. We'll get to those during, during the presentation. But yeah, I wanted to give a brief introduction uh, about myself. Uh, my name is Frank. I work at a company called Zillas. Um, we are a startup and we're all about uh, a vector database ecosystem. I'll get to that a little bit more in the slides as well. I'm currently an architect and uh, if there are any folks who wish to get in touch um, or are curious to know, to talk a bit more about some of the work that we're doing here with Toki or with Movis as well, some of, uh, another one of the open source projects that we contribute fairly heavily to, um, I'd be happy to get in touch offline. So yeah, so I want to give a quick overview of the contents of this presentation first. Uh, so in the first section, I'll talk a bit about the concept of unstructured data, um, exactly what it is, uh, why it's important to us today, and where we're going with that in the future. After that, I'll talk a bit about embeddings, uh, in particular, how embeddings can be used to help us with semantic search. Um, I'll also talk a bit about missing pieces in scalable semantic search as well. I think, you know, for especially for a conference like Berlin Buzzwords, being able to perform semantic analysis uh, is a very, very important, very key topic there. Uh, in the fourth section, I'll talk a bit about Tohi, um, which is uh, which is really much our attempt at trying to fill in a lot of these missing pieces in scalable semantic search. Uh, we'll talk about some of the challenges that we faced during this entire process, some of the user feedback that we received, uh, and also I'll go over some very, very brief code examples as well. At the very end, I'll probably spend about 10 minutes uh, on some demos um, and then uh, uh, probably about five, 10 minutes for Q&A. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. So what is unstructured data, right? Um, you know, I think back, you know, to the, to the early advent of computers, uh, storing data has always been a major, you know, storing, searching, you know, indexing across uh, different types of data has always been a very, very key application for computers. Uh, you know, very early on, a lot of data was structured. So you can imagine, let's say, a relational database that's meant to store tabular data. Uh, and as, you know, as the internet grew and evolved, as industries grew and evolved around, um, and around the internet, around the concept of storing and searching data, we ended up having pieces of data of increasing complexity. So, um, a lot of, on the, I want to say 2010s, uh, a lot of NoSQL databases became very popular, um, you know, methods for transforming, extracting meaning, and searching across, let's say, JSON or, uh, or wide column stores, so on and so forth. And I think we really, uh, you know, in the past, uh, past five years and the upcoming you know, several decades, uh, we're really looking at a transformation into what we like to call unstructured data. Uh, data of significantly increasing complexity. Uh, and some examples of those are on the right-hand side of the screen right there. So uh, graphs, um, there's protein structures, molecular structures, uh, images, video, audio, text, a lot of human-generated data, uh, maps. Um, you know, we have a wide, wide variety of uh, increasingly complex unstructured data. And, you know, the question, I think, becomes how do we... Uh, how do we store, search, and index across all that data in, in an efficient manner? And this really brings me to the concept of, uh, of using vectors to represent unstructured data. Uh, and I know, you know, in the Berlin Bellers audience, there's probably quite a few folks who know about embeddings already. Uh, so I'll go over this fairly, fairly, you know, I'll go over this briefly. Um, and then, you know, I'm happy to take a, uh, some more clarifying questions at the end. So, Really, I think the key gist of it is that we want to be able to leverage the power of machine learning. We want to be able to leverage the power of deep learning models to transform our unstructured data into these vectors called embeddings. And these embeddings are essentially really powerful semantic representations of our input data. So an example that I always like to go to is the concept of, you know, I'm a I'm a computer vision guy, um, so uh, and I, you know, I love German shepherds. Uh, and if I if I have two images of German shepherds uh, with a properly trained deep model, uh, 
generating vectors from those deep models, embeddings from those deep deep uh, deep learning models, I should be able to have two embeddings which are very very close to each other in Euclidean space. I'll get you know I'll get to I'll get into a little bit more detail on that in the upcoming uh, in a couple of upcoming slides. So with that being said, um, I think one you know a, a motto that we like to have here with the Toei project um, is we really want to be able to embed the world, and we really believe that this will help uh, will help you know individuals, organizations, companies, entire industries really leverage and help understand the unstructured data that they have, help them be able to perform scalable semantic search, semantic analysis over all this data. Now, uh, the, the image that you see there um, was taken through word to bag embeddings uh, on uh, the TensorFlow projector uh, online. It's available, just freely available to everybody. And you'll see, again, the, the idea of a semantic representation being reflected there again, which you see up towards the top of that, um, of that, the, the, the dot you know, the dot chart, and you'll see a lot of uh, molecular uh, words that are associated with uh, biology, physics, chemistry. Towards the bottom, you see a lot of names. Towards the right, there's a lot of functions, processes, um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, embeddings really are a powerful way to be able to help us understand the world. All right, so in the next section, I want to talk a bit about uh, how we can use embeddings to do semantic search. Uh, now I did dive, a, I did touch, excuse me, a little bit briefly upon this already, which is the definition of an, of an embedding, right? An embedding is an underlying vector representation uh, that encodes the meaning behind a piece of unstructured data. Uh, and the key, you know, the key idea here is that it encodes the semantic representation. So uh, the semantic representation of, let's say, either a word, you know, a, a sentence, a paragraph, an image, a video, um, or even a protein structure. I'll give a, uh, I'll give a more sort of in-depth example about how these embeddings uh, specifically they look to a computer, how they look to us, and how they can be used to help us understand unstructured data. Uh, so here's an example of a multimodal embedding. Um, this is you know, just a toy example uh, where I have uh, this, con this, this sentence, a toe perched on a tree branch, as well as an image that actually corresponds very much to this sentence. And you'll see that through you know, the power of machine learning, I'm able to transform these into vectors that are very, very close to each other in Euclidean space. Um, and this really forms the crux of how we can use these embeddings to uh, help us understand the world a little bit better. Uh, looking ahead a little bit, um, so sort of towards the end of this talk, uh, I will give a quick demo on reverse image search, how we can build a reverse image search platform using uh, using Tohi, you know, using this uh, this open source project that I'll be talking about. And really, um, this is a sneak peek where uh, there I, I wanted to put a, a, a computer vision example in here as well, um, where. We have these query images. This is from the Unsplash data set. We have these query images, and then there are, here are the nearest neighbors uh, for the first 1,000 images. Uh, and this is really looking ahead, right? You'll see the first row uh, is very much plants. The second row is, you know, they correspond to mountains or wilderness, wildlife. Uh, and the third row is very forest or forest-like pictures. Um, so really, how do we build something like that? Uh, how do we leverage embeddings to be able to build something like that is something that I'll be getting into uh, later on during the demo. All right. So now with uh, now that we've covered what unstructured data is and how we can use embeddings to help us understand that unstructured data, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the missing pieces in scalable semantic search. Uh, you know, the Unstructured data, I think, is very much uh, still in its uh, sort of wild west form. Um, and some of the challenges that we uh, were trying to fix with this open source project. So, you know, when we spoke to a lot of users, you know, when we spoke to a lot of folks, uh, especially for myself, I think having been in um, machine learning for quite a while, a big complaint that we always get is there are so many different types of models and you know there's so many different frameworks that we can use to deploy those models 
uh, a big question is which one should I use, um, and how do I be, you know, how do I test so many of these, so many of these different models within the same framework? Um, and you know, I uh, up on the screen there, there's an example where uh, Bert. Um, uh, there's if you go do a search for on GitHub for an open source implementation of Bert, you'll see you know dozens of open source implementations, possibly even dozens of pre-trained models. Um, all of which can be used to generate uh, textual embeddings. And you know, that sort of ties in with the second one, uh, the second sort of main problem that we see uh, with scalable semantic search as well, which is we want there to be a easy to use method for developing embedding applications. Um, and I'll define what exactly an embedding application is right here real quick. Uh, it is any application um, that uses embeddings to perform semantic search or semantic analysis. Diving a little bit deeper further into that, you'll see in the center section right there or towards the left-hand side of this um, uh, of this uh, sort of flow chart, there is a key component that we really believe is missing today for unstructured data applications, and that is ETL, uh, as well as data flow, data pipelining. Um, data pipelining, you know, you do have open source projects like Apache Airflow and Spark, um, but I would say those are not necessarily 100% dedicated to the idea of unstructured data flow. Uh, ETL, for those of you who um, are a little bit less familiar with databases or database systems, is uh, extract, transformation, and load. Uh, particularly, we have a strong emphasis on the transformation side. How do we transform unstructured data into something that we can use uh, for semantic analysis? Now, in particular, I do want to spend a bit of time to talk about a uh, vector database. Um, we do have a sister project called Milvis, uh, and a vector database is essentially a database that allows you to store these embeddings, very key components for a lot of embedding applications. Uh, we currently have integration, direct integration with Milvis within Toki, but we are looking to add others, other vector databases as well. Uh, and this brings me to the third, and I think, final sort of missing piece in uh, scalable semantic search, which is how do we run embedding applications at scale? Um, you know, there are a lot of platforms uh, which will allow which will allow you to take a model and run those in a distributed fashion, run those in an ML ops framework. Um, you know, AWS is SageMaker, and Google's Vertex AI are two, I think, pretty well known examples of that. But you know, beyond just deploying the model to the cloud, you know, we when we speak to our users, there's more than just a model, right? Um, oftentimes, maybe they want to first read an image or read, uh, you know, read some piece of unstructured data from S3 or MinIO, or perhaps they want to do a glob from a local file system. Uh, then they want to do tokenization, filtering, or encoding, uh, especially you know when it comes to the encoding part. If let's say they're running, um, let's say a some type of multimodal application, or if they're doing uh, let's say you know, some tra vision transformer based, being able to encode image patches. Uh, after the model, there is often there's oftentimes decoding, post processing, or PCA and whitening, and then at the very end, uh, sometimes there will be a remote write or writing to a vector database. Now, these are all components that are very important in uh, these embedding applications, but. Uh, I would argue that there is no real great way to be able to deploy these at scale, to be able to integrate these very tightly uh, in a distributed or a cloud native fashion. So the question becomes, how do we run these, how do we run entire embedding applications at scale, being able to leverage both my local machine, uh, as well as the capabilities of an on-prem cloud, or, uh, excuse me, on-prem sort of suite of servers or, or the cloud. All right, so I'll do uh, you know a quick recap on these three sort of missing pieces that I was talking about earlier, and uh, how do we solve these? Is you know we we really sat down and thought about these for quite a while, and we want number one a library that integrates a variety of embedding models, uh, both open and closed source, and ideally with pre-trained weights, so that. Um, so that users can try these embedding models, can swap out different embedding models to see which one fits their application the best. The second one is that we want a library that is application oriented, not model oriented. Now, uh, to do this, uh, this is a sneak peek at sort of what we've been, what we try to do with Toki, which is that we try to define 
models as atomic units of work within an application pipeline uh, as these very, very specific operators and not as uh, we try to make uh, a library that is not model centric, but is uh, application centric, data centric. And there's also, hopefully, within this library, some way of serving applications to the cloud, uh, specifically serving load balanced embedding applications, and also automatically the models that are used, uh, you know, have automatic optimizations for the models that are used in that application. And on top of that, this is not something that I talked about um, in the previous couple of slides, but hopefully some quality of, of life improvements as well. Um, you know, a generic model fine tuner and also the capability to do attention and embedding visualizations. We found to be very important both to us uh, in terms of generating these, uh, in terms of creating these applications, as well as to our users. All right, so um, this brings me to my fourth section, which is uh, say hello to Tohi. Um, and uh, I did mention Tohi a bit in, uh, in, in the previous couple of slides. Tohi is really uh, our attempt at developing an open source developer-oriented library for embedding applications. Um, and I'll go over each of these bit by bit, right? Open source, you know, the concept I think is clear to a lot of folks here at Bergen Buzzwords. Um, you know, it's freely available for anybody to use, uh, to contribute on GitHub. Uh, developer-oriented means that we want to make it um, not really a machine learning library per, per se, but more of a library that allows engineers to prototype new applications. Uh, and you'll see exactly how we, you know, how we went about that um, in the upcoming couple of slides. And embedding applications, we, def you know, we defined that in uh, a previous slide, which is an application that uses embeddings um, to perform semantic search or semantic analysis. And we'll get to how Tohi fulfills all of these functions uh, very soon. All right, so a quick overview of Tohi. Um, you know, going back, I want to say, you know, a couple months ago or several months ago, um, you know, we had a lot of users, uh, we had a lot of folks um, that we were engaging with at Zillis that were complaining about the lack of standardization between uh, open source model libraries. Uh, so for Tohi, we really tried to take a lot of these open source model libraries, you know, PyTorch image models, Torch Vision Deep Face um, Transformers. Uh, huge shout out and respect to the Hugging Face team for building such an awesome uh, you know, NLP library. Taking those and wrapping them within a unit of work called an operator. Uh, and again, we'll get to that a little bit more uh, in, the, in the upcoming couple of slides. We also have um, over 400 embedding centric pipelines. Um, you know, the concept of a pipeline is uh, a collection of operator, operators organized into a directed acyclic graph. Uh, and that we really take, uh, we really sort of took. Uh, take that took that concept uh, you know, from Apache Spark and other open source libraries and try to apply it to unstructured data here as well. Uh, and then, you know, we also have these, uh, you know, going, go, touching upon that a little bit further, we have a lot of image, video, audio, text embedding pipelines. We have image tagging and face landmark pipelines as well. So not, uh, not exactly embedding pipelines, but also within the realm of understanding unstructured data. And we also have something cool that I like to call, um, you know, that we call internally ensemble embedding pipelines. So the idea of taking an ensemble of different networks, uh, you know, efficient net, NFNet, uh, you know, vision uh, and being able to ensemble those to create a much more representative uh, embedding, uh, an embedding that is more powerful than each individual, than you know the embeddings generated by each individual model. Uh, we also have a training fine tuning sub framework within Tohi to allow folks to be able to uh, fine tune an embedding model to be able to generate, you know, to be able to be a lot more. Uh, oriented towards the application that they're developing. And we also have um, something called data collection, uh, which I will, I'll touch upon in the next slide as well, which is a method chaining API. And that'll allow folks to build entire app, you know, embedding applications in a single line of code. Now I do put line in quotes there. Um, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure in, in, you know, when I was, you know, when I, when I, when I was a kid, um, you know, listening to the radio, uh, there would always be, you know, you, 
there, you know, there'd all be these advertisements and they would have, uh, at the very end, they would you know, talk really fast and say, okay, you know, this is, uh, there are, there are all these caveats to, to this particular product or, or, or so on and so forth. Um, that's really, that's really why I, I, I wrap, uh, line in quotes here, which is that, uh, it is a single line of code, but, uh, being a method generating API, um, we allow users to be able to, um, chain together a lot of these different, uh, operations within data collection to be able to build that, that application. So, uh, we'll get into that a little bit in the next slide. All right. So, an overview of data collection itself. Uh, data collection is a method chaining API, and I think very much inspired by uh, Spark slash you know, PySpark, um, and also by uh, Ray Datasets and some of these other open source libraries as well. And it allows for prototyping and deployment of these embedding applications. We also have very, very tight integration with the Tohi Hub, uh, and I'll get to that in example two. But before we dive any deeper further into what Tohi is, um, I'd like to give a quick example uh, of how data collection can be used. Uh, you see in example one here, um, we have uh, we have this very we have sort of like a toy example, where first. Um, I want to be able to, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a list of values from zero to 99 inclusive. Um, and if I have a function called is prime, which will filter out, you know, give me a true or false, depending on whether or not my input data is a prime number. Uh, I'm able to filter out prime numbers using a single call based on a data collection. I can then filter that even further by saying, okay, I want the, um, I want it to, I want that number to end in a three, uh, map that to a string. You can see in that panel up in line of example one, and then have, and then create a list out of that. And what that'll allow me to do is, uh, the output of that is three, 13, 23, um, uh, all the way to 83 prime numbers that end with three in the range of zero to 99. This is very much a toy example of how Toei can be used. Again, it's inspired very much by Spark and PySpark. Um, and uh, sort of how, how we were able to take that and leverage that to be able to build these applications. So for example, too, this is something that's very much closer to what Tohi was designed to do, um, where we can uh, glob for a path, you know, for all these images in a path to, and a directory to, uh, let's say, you know, a thousand or 10,000 images, I can decode all of those, turn them into NumPy arrays, and then perform image embedding on them using the ResNet 50 model. I can then take that entire image embedding and then, or take the entire image embedding for all, uh, all of those image embeddings, excuse me, and turn that into a list. So that's uh, example two. And again, example two is much closer to what we mean when we say that Data collection helps users build entire embedding applications. I'll talk a little bit about um, Tohi Dataflow, especially as it relates to data collection. Um, each arrow in this particular diagram that you see here is a data collection object. And each box is a single function call. And I really want to draw your attention to the image embedding pipeline and the audio embedding pipeline in the uh, top box and the bottom box, respectively. Those are what we call pipelines that are available on the Tohi Hub. So if you call those within data collection, it'll automatically pull those pipelines from Tohi and be able to use them within your broader data collection application. Uh, again, I won't go too much deeper. I won't go too deep into exactly you know what this uh, video-based application is trying to implement, but it really, I think, helps understand uh, the data flow within a data collection. Whoops. Okay, cool. And uh, I also, I won't touch upon this too much uh, because the architecture for Tohi is very much in flux. Tohi is a very young project. Um, but I will say that uh, in terms of making Tohi, you know, like a cloud native distributed architecture, we're really trying to leverage a lot of existing open source tools. Uh, especially, you know, we, we want to be able to have a concept of an inference server that we can run and scale horizontally on the cloud, something that is based on top of Triton um, and also Ray. Uh, and we want to be able to leverage a lot of the Triton optimizations, you know, auto-batching, direct on-GPU 
uh, you know, on GPU optimizations, the use of optimized libraries, uh, MKL, you know, on top of CUDA, automatically leveraging GPUs and other accelerators, um, and being able to have a variety of backends that we can then run. Uh, we can then run an entire application on. And that's really important to us, right? Being able to have not just a backend that can run machine learning models, but also backends that can, um, going back to, if you remember the previous slide, uh, read from S3, read from MinIO, perform you know, PCA, perform whitening, perform encoding, decoding, all sorts of pre and post processing. Uh, again, I won't dive too deep into this architecture, um, if, uh, if there are folks who are more interested in this, I'm happy to have a conversation offline or to take questions during the Q&A section as well. All right, and I do want to you know, very briefly talk about what Tohi is not, um, because we do have, you know, when, 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 when I go out and talk to other folks about Tohi, we do have some of these questions as well. Tohi is not an autograd library. Uh, it is not PyTorch, uh, it is not TensorFlow, um, and it is not a high level wrapper for these odd grad libraries either. You know, these um, PyTorch and TensorFlow, I think were very much meant for model development, whereas Toei is meant for application development. Toei is meant for ETL and data pipelining, application pipelining. Uh, and, you know, high level wrappers like, um, I think for TensorFlow in particular, uh, something like Keras is meant to really improve the usability of these auto grad libraries, uh, make it more modular, extensible, and have fewer lines of code. Uh, Toei is also not just another model hub. Uh, in particular, I think uh, if you go to our website, Toei.io, you'll see we're very much focused on being able to provide entire operators and provide entire uh, pipelines for our users to use. Um, and Toki is also not an ML ops slash model ops platform. You know, a lot of the work on annotation verification uh, and being able to train and deploy pipe, uh, train and deploy models end to end. That's not what Tohi is trying to do. Uh, we're really, really developer oriented and we want to allow developers to the prototype a wide variety of models in their application. All right, um, now I do want to jump very quickly to some quick demos. Uh, I know we have about 15 minutes left, so I'll try to spend no more than um, 10 minutes on these, five to 10 minutes on these. Um, so if we could jump over to the screen sharing that I have open, that would be great. All right. Okay, cool. So um, I'm actually, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to clear this real quick. So this is an iPython notebook that is freely available on our GitHub, rep GitHub repository. Um, and this is using Tohi to build uh, a reverse image search engine. Uh, now um, I'll go over, I won't sort of go over each of these steps in detail. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of each of these. Um, but really what we're trying to do first, there's uh, there are some data preparation steps. Um, we want to be able to, you know, I've already downloaded this data here. So we want to be able to read all the data in and you'll see that um, we have uh, a lot of these images and labels. Uh, now what I want to be able to do is, uh, you know, I have some helper functions here, which I'll actually come back to. Uh, we'll create a collection using, using Milvis. Again, I won't dive too deep into here. Uh, and I think really the meat of this, uh, this code demo is being able to actually build this reverse image search application. Um, and what we're gonna do first is we're going to compute a bunch of image embeddings and load them into Milvis. So what we're gonna do first is import Tohi. And then specifically, I'm going to run this first, uh, run this uh, this box first, because it will take a bit of time to run, uh, about three, three and a half minutes, I think, on my local machine. But what we're trying to do here, I'll go into each of these individually, which is uh, we call Tohi, and we want to be able to read the contents of the CSV, you know, this CSV right here, of which the, these are um, are the first five lines. Now, given the contents of that CSV, right, uh, I want to then run as an operator this function, this lambda function. Now, I won't go too deep into this, but the real meat, the real, the real meat and potatoes of this uh, of this data collection is taking the contents of that, um, decoding the image, and then performing uh, computing and image embedding on them. 
I'll talk exactly about what uh, what's in these square brackets here. Uh, these are essentially inputs and outputs uh, of this particular operation. Um, and uh, going to this image decode, for example, I want to be able to take a path as an input and the output should be an image. It should be um, a NumPy array or a tensor that I can use to then input into the next operation within this data collection. The, this, uh, this line in particular, it then takes the image, the, the NumPy array or the tensor that I've output from the previous step. It'll then turn that into a vector. The way it does that is by running a machine learning model. Um, we're using Resonant 15 in this case. And then the final line here is it will actually insert all of these embeddings into a Milvus collection. So we just created a Milvus collection in this line called reverse image search. Uh, and the, the vector length for that particular collection is 2048. Um, and being able to insert all of these uh, is specifically what this line is meant to do. So going back to the very beginning, uh, we want to read the contents of the CSV that we just downloaded. We want to be able to run that. Uh, we want to be able to, um, this is a, this run as op really just turns one column of that CSV into something that's usable by the rest of the application. We're going to decode the image, compute an image embedding over it, and then uh, insert all of those into Milvus. So this particular step is not quite done yet, um, but so yeah, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit while we're waiting for this one to be done. Uh, yeah, so here's an here's the great explanation um, of what's going on in this data processing pipeline in this data processing application. Uh, once you know this, once this particular box wraps up, what we're going to do is we are going to um, query for similar images within Milvus. Uh, and the way we do that is, you know, is, is very similar to inserting into Milvus, uh, inserting these images, uh, excuse me, inserting these embeddings into Milvus using Tohi. And that is done by, again, decoding the image, computing embeddings over it. Um, and then we have another operation called Milvus search. And that will really, you know, that is really going to allow us to be able to query for similar candidate images uh, within Milvus, within a vector database. Um, after that, we're going to do some quick evaluation. Uh, I won't dive too much into the optimizations that can be done here. Um, this notebook is available freely online on uh, the Tohi IO repository. So anybody who's interested in uh, getting to know a little bit more about that, I highly encourage everybody to go online to take a look. All right, so this is still running. Um, it is taking a little bit longer than, uh, than I had anticipated. So what I'll do in the meantime is I'll, I'll talk a bit about these two helper functions here, as well as creating a Milvus collection. Um, so these two helper functions really, they're just meant to read in uh, the images as well as extract the ground truth labels. And this will be important for us later on as we go uh, and look at, um, as we go and look at uh, the, the results of the embedding application. Okay, perfect. So that is done. Uh, that took a little bit more than three minutes, close to four minutes actually. And the number of embeddings that we inserted into this vector database is a total of a thousand embeddings. So we did this, we computed all of these embeddings and we inserted them into Milvus, a vector database, uh, all within about four minutes using Tohi. Uh, and it, mind you, I am. This is all running on a local machine on a single CPU. Um, so you know, if we run it on the cloud or we run it in a distributed fashion, uh, using the architecture that I uh, showed in the slides, it'll be much faster. Now, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump a little bit further ahead because I do want to leave uh, about five minutes for Q and A. Um, you know, here is uh, some visualizations for uh, what we were doing earlier. And now really, I think the fun part is we can query for similar images um, using Milvus, uh, using data collection, uh, using these pipelines and using the, the tools that Tohi provides. So, you know, doing those, uh, these are the first three rows. And this is, um, I'm not exactly sure what this is. This is a, 
uh, well, this is a furry animal. Uh, and, you know, the closest neighbors to this particular image uh, are these five uh, over here. There are, in the second row, um, these are, you know, planes, fighter jets, so on and so forth, airplanes. Um, and these, you know, the, the five resulting images are its nearest neighbors. And for the third row, you know, the same thing there. Uh, now, I won't dive too deep into the evaluation here. Um, you know, there are various optimizations that we can do. Um, we can increase the model complexity, run different models, and also release a showcase. Those can all be done, um, again, using Toki, and we can develop entire applications using this framework. Yeah, and I know um, we are running out of time, so what I'm going to do is uh, there is another notebook that I wanted to go over. Um, I encourage everybody to go online onto our repo, uh, again, because we are running out of time. I apologize. I I'm not able to show this today, but I do want to leave, there are about, there's about five minutes left. So I do want to leave five minutes for Q and A. Um, I'm not sure if there, uh, if we have any questions in the audience today, or excuse me, if we have any audience members um, who have questions. Uh, so, Rajan Taim, uh, congrats. Um, thank you for giving us such a good uh, presentation. So, I don't know if you have some questions now. So, maybe we can uh, use these five minutes if you have something else to show us. Um, sure, yeah. So, if we can go back to the screen share. Um, uh, I did so, see um, that we, we finally have a question. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I have a small question. Is there a particular reason why you use the ResNet for uh, generating the embeddings? Yeah, because like sometimes they are like, especially to find duplicate image, like their hashing techniques or even complex models. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, and I think uh, depending I will, I'll answer that really briefly. I think depending on the application that you're trying to build. Uh, so we have users where they want to do image deduplication. Um, and in that case, having a model that's trained using contrastive learning um, would be much more powerful. Now, Tohi is meant to allow you to plug and play a variety of different operations, a variety of different models uh, to see which one works best for you. And the reason why we use ResNet 50 was not to was not be because we believe it's the best model. Um, ResNet 50, I think, is a very ubiquitous one, and it's one that a lot of folks know. Um, and we wanted to be able to show that hey, you know, we are able to. Uh, on top of using a very, very well-known model, we are able to drag, to drag and drop or replace that with a lot of other different models as well to be able to uh, prototype um, all of these different embedding applications that you can build. So yeah, great question. We're still having two minutes if we have uh, another question, maybe. So as you want, we can use it to talk about something like you were doing before. Sure, yeah. Um, oh, wow. So, sorry, there's a bit of echo there. I will say that uh, if, you know, I, I really want to, um, there are two minutes left, so I'm not sure if there will be too much time to talk about um, to talk about the, the, the video retrieval engine. Uh, there, I do encourage everybody to go online and take a look at it. Um, I think it is very cool. Unfortunately, we didn't we didn't have too much we didn't have enough time to go over today. But um, the idea is that we are able to using uh, something called Clip for Clip, which is essentially doing multimodal text to video embeddings. Um, we can actually you know find. We can actually, given a sentence, be able to find a corresponding video that matches that sentence pretty well. Uh, and again, you know, in the in, in the interest of time, uh, I, I'm not going to go over and show this specifically, but uh, I do encourage everybody to uh, go to our open source repo. Um, it is tohi-io/tohi, um, and take a look at that. Uh, can we go back to the PowerPoint very quickly? Um, I'm going to uh, sort of. There's a resources page that I want that I would like to share with everybody. Yeah. So. So yeah, right here. Um, if uh, if folks are interested in some of the some of the work that we're doing, um, uh, I highly encourage everybody to uh, you know to come and take a look. Uh, 
on our main website, on our GitHub, on our Twitter. And yeah, I think that is pretty much it. Um, just to wrap up, I really want to thank everybody for coming uh, to this presentation, for coming to this talk. Um, I'm happy to uh, chat with anybody offline or um, happy to chat with anybody further about Tohi or about embeddings or about embedding applications. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>